the amazing Ray Hughes. To be anywhere, <laughs> especially here today. I'm, I'm really, I've been looking forward to this, y'all. And I know it's going to take you just a minute or two to figure out if this is an accent or an affliction. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it is an accent and it comes from Kentucky. Though I don't live in Kentucky now, I, I wish, in so many ways, I wish I did. Uh, because I understand and, and grew up to know that Kentucky is where God lives. <laughs> and um, it, Kentucky is such a, such a reflection of the beauty and the diversity and the, uh, of the dreams of God. And um, I look back at it with those very affections. Been gone from there a long time. But I also look back at where I came from as anything but the, the dreams of God. Uh, because of the darkness that was in the land as well. Uh, but, but darkness uh, is, um, is something that we, we all have to rise above when the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives. And that's what happened with me. And uh, just, for, uh, just for, for the purpose of introduction and for us to get to know each other a little bit, I tell you, I came from uh, seven generations of redneck non-achievers. <laughs> and just a dark isolated, insulated culture. Uh, a lot of music, uh, if you're from Kentucky, if you, if you get to be five or six years old and you don't play at least one instrument, you're sort of outcast. <laughs> because everything evolves around music. And everything in, within the, the culture, within the culture is storytelling whether you know it or not. And I, I don't know, my, my definition of a storyteller is just uh, a guardian of memories. And I have guarded the memories of what God has done all my life, uh, and that has what, what has given me language that enabled me to travel all over the world now for 46 years and do what I do. And because uh, it's to me, it's not necessarily about education as much as it's about fascination with what God has done in my life. And that's what brought me out of Kentucky, uh, because uh, when I was a, uh, I, as I said, I was raised in a. I was raised in a two-room house, and there was 13 of us lived in a two-room house, and we had one light bulb, and that was enough. And we had to get our water about 50 yards from the house, and an old spring coming out of the side of the hill. And there was a lean-to kitchen built on the back of the house. And we were, we were raised to be isolated and afraid of the outside world uh, because of, of the pain that had been in former generations. But I was the first one that the Holy Spirit drew out of that and into an encounter with Him. And that's where you, I learned, I didn't know it at the time because I didn't have the language for it, but I learned that those who have encounters with God now carry encounters with God. And because of what the Lord had done in my life, I, I, um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of drunkenness, abuse, darkness, uh, pain uh, of all sorts, uh, all sorts of abuses and poverty and all of that, living where we did. But then, uh, but, it, but then, uh, a glorious light came into my life, and I actually got I got saved at a rock and roll dance in my hometown in 1971. And uh, a friend started telling me about what Jesus had done in his life, and I gave my heart to the Lord that night at this rock and roll dance. I went out there just to sell drugs. And, uh, but, uh, but I heard the message of the gospel that night, just from a friend. And uh, before the night was over, I wound up, and while the band was hitting about an eight on the Richter scale, and the lights flashing, and by that time we, had become, we were hillbilly hippies in, uh, in Kentucky. And, and while the band was hitting eight on the Richter scale, as I said, while this song was going on, he led me to the Lord, and I wound up kneeling and giving my heart to Jesus in a puddle of beer that someone had spilled on the floor. And so that caused me to realize that, uh, you know, later I realized what had happened was that I planted a brand new family tree. Because uh, I came up from there a brand new creation. And old things had passed away and all things became new. And, and somehow the Lord then put, put dream in my life. And, and I don't know if you've realized it or not, but you know, dreams, uh, dreams don't even have to come true to be valuable. 
sometimes, sometimes dream, God will <coughs> send dreams along into your life to awaken who you will become. But dreams don't have to become true always to be valuable. Sometimes those dreams are what God will use to just sustain hope in your life until a greater knowing of His purpose for your life comes to you as you walk, as you walk toward your destiny. And that's what happened with me. Uh, I began to dream of outrageous dreams. I believe that I believe that uh, God could uh, could use my life, and that would have been a very outrageous dream to have, uh, uh, coming from the background that I did. But <clears throat> another factor that was always that was always involved, uh, even even from those earliest moments, uh, was was uh, the music. Because we were such a musical culture, a part of our language uh, was music. One of the, and, and though, though music has many, many languages and many dialects, of course, but uh, I want to talk to you today about what it looked like to, on, on that journey, not only for me, but the, somewhat of the journey for David. And, it, and you'll find that, that your journey many times be, can be applied, or our journeys can be applied, but simply because we were created to worship. And God used David uh, to model a reality that would awaken dreams in future generations. Because when you think about it, all David was was just a, a kid playing a harp in the middle of the field with no political prowess, no political ambition. He had no intentions of being a king. He had no intentions of even exploring anything other than the wonder that he felt in his heart when he would interact with God. And he would set out in a place called the Shepherd's Field, or the Tower of the Flock it was, a place outside of Bethlehem in isolation. And his job was, was to uh, shepherd and oversee the, the lambs, the sheep that had already been designated to be the sacrificial lambs when it come time to sacrifice. And there he, and of course David was a multi-instrumentalist. He played numerous harps. He played, he played a, a, a reed pipe or a pibgorn, if you will, uh, a reeded flute. He played, he played numerous harps. He played a neville. He played a, a, a lyra. He played a kenner. And that would be the kind of harp or, that he would use in the shepherd's field. And a kenner was, a, and also a shimoneth, which would be like a double bass, uh, a double bass harp. Uh, and it was it was eight string, and it, and it released the low thunderous sounds that would one that, that he would one day then bring into the kingdom once the tabernacle of David was established. That would have been those carrying the low frequencies, if you will, because he innately knew, prophetically knew, somehow with the sensitivity that he had to the presence of God and the desires of God in his life, he knew that tone had a lot to do uh, with word. Hmm. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, that he, he even wrote songs and, uh, that would have to be only translated or only interpreted by certain instruments because it carried the tonal value of what he was seeing in the spirit realm when he was writing the spot and spending his song. And so seven times a day, David would just break into a spontaneous song and he had appointed people to follow him around. They were called a Zakhar ministry. They would follow him around and scribe every word that he would say, and then he would say, "Get this to the chief musician upon Shoshanidith or Shemineth or whatever instrument it would be." They would carry the tonal value of what he was sensing as this prophetic song would be born. And we know that the songs were prophetic for numerous reasons. And remember, prophecy is not about telling you what to do. Prophecy is about awakening who you are. Yeah. And so when the song that he would access heaven with, and even while he was sitting in the shepherd's field, he was writing music that was going to awaken all of Israel to who they were created to be. And they were so prophetic in nature. Remember, prophecy doesn't tell you what to do. It awakens who you are. And yeah. prophecy is not just about um, pr predicting the future. It's about creating the future. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and another thing we oversee, not only is it about <laughs> predicting the future and creating the future, it's yeah. also prophecy is about preventing the future. Mm -hmm. He had the ability of God to prevent future dead, you know, seasons of death and famine, 
They could prevent that because they would release a song that would awaken people to reveal the glory of God and God would inhabit those praises, reveal Himself in such a way that if you were in the presence of God, you, were, you would experience favor, not famine. Mm -hmm. And because song and music is such a, 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 such a, a force in the earth, God's people, under the tutelage and training of David, they were able to create atmospheres that the enemy could not invade for 33 years, 24 hours a day for 33 years. No enemy could, could uh, uh, invade the people of God. That's incredible when you think about it. Because there was a sound of a song of sustained deliverance that released the favor of God on them as a people. And, and, and he set a whole uh, understanding of music in place that had never been realized. See, think about this. Some, some worship songs, some worship songs create an atmosphere that constrains the imagination and protects the services from worship. And some, but some atmospheres, some songs, reveal the presence of God in such a way that you get just a glimpse of His glory, reveals His nature in such a way that your song reflects His presence. And where His presence is, there's always healing in life and joy and, and, and so on. Well, David created a whole culture to have those kind of knowings. And uh, now when, when he did that, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll point out some things as we, as we go along here. Uh, I, I, I sort of want to tell you that uh, it, what we'll do is, is I'll try to, I'll try to, you know, at, at any time that I'm talking along, and anybody has a question or I'll run off and leave something, <laughs> just raise your hand and ask that question again. Because it doesn't bother me at all. And I, t and I talk in circles. I don't talk in Greek linear. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think in straight lines, so I won't talk in straight lines. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a Greek thing. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm far more Celtic blood than I am Greek. Uh, so I, I'll... Um, but if you hang on, most of the time we come back by it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not homiletics class, okay? This is, I, but I'm going to talk to you about music. I'm going to talk to you about the prophetic. I'm going to talk to you what, about what it would have looked like in the days that David set up this amazing and wonderful culture. Now remember, I said, here he was on the backside of the desert, or, or there he was actually in the, in the shepherd's field, the tower of the flock. And there he was playing, playing this music. And, and God heard this young shepherd musician sitting out there playing. And until this day, uh, David is the only one that God ever said this about. He said, there is a man after my own heart. <laughs> and I believe God then would have said, wow, look how, you know, I think I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> because of his worship, I'm going to give him my heart. And... It's like, to, to whatever degree we give God our heart and worship, so shall He give us His heart yeah. for humanity, for culture, and for music, and for mm -hmm. arts, and for, for entertainment, and for the medical world, the educational systems, and, and governmental structures. See, God could entrust a young boy that had no political prowess or ambition to rise up and create whole new standards in every arena of life for all of His people because it was the overflow of his worship that made it happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and don't forget what happened there either. When we, when we talk about prophetic music setting, setting uh, not only uh, predicting, but creating and preventing, what he was doing is he was setting promises in motion. Covenant promises that God had for his people were being set in motion by his song. And, and one, just one example of that would be he said, now worshiping God in this field, creating an atmosphere that God cannot, cannot resist, which was his worship. And then in the very feet at Shepherd's Field, where, where he was sanctioned to be there to uh, shepherd the lambs, uh, the sheep that would become the sacrificial lambs, in that atmosphere, a thousand years later, a sound comes from heaven and in a manger in the middle of that field, a baby is born. He created an atmosphere for Jesus to inhabit his praise yeah. in future generations. Yeah. A thousand years, that song was holding 
the desire of God and the intent of God in that atmosphere because a young dreamer, yeah. a young poet, a young storyteller, a young imaginator that had been given God's permission to imagine the wonder of who he was and, and, and interpret it with a soundtrack of his own life. And as he would be playing that harp, and that particular harp that he was playing, the Kimmer, was known to release joy. It wasn't a little contemplative kind of melancholy, uh, meditative kind of thing out there with those sheep. But that harp that he played in the shepherd's field had bone and pieces of metal and strings laced through the strings so that when you smack that harp, it would have a percussive sound connected to each string. And it was the one that denoted the joy. And that's, so you can imagine what it was, must have looked like if you'd walk by the shepherd's field, see some young guy out there playing this harp and dancing all over the place in the middle of nowhere, interacting with God. And because he was encountering God, now he carried an encounter. And because he was a worshiper, he was fulfilling the reason he exists. Because if we're a worship, if, if we're created to worship and we don't, or we're not a worshiper, we forfeit the reason we exist. Yeah. And not so watch this. If we're created to worship, and we're created by the Creator to be creative, should not our worship be far more creative than than just the sameness of liturgical ideas. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, what happens in many churches across the world, what we do is we sink everybody to the lowest common denominator creatively, and we call that unity. When in fact, it's sameness. It's not unity, it's sameness. It's, it's trying to create a model that says, here are your restrictions, here are your boundaries, and here are your limitations. Well, David didn't have any limitations. Of sheep walking around, and he had all the passion of his heart. The passion that was in his heart to worship God is what determined his boundaries. And, yeah. and, and, I, and, I, and I declare to us today that there's boundless grace and unlimited creativity. What is, what is grace? A divine infusion of God's enablement to your life yeah. to see to it that you fulfill your destiny. Yeah. Boundless grace, unlimited creativity. And see, you are of the generation that are, that are now rising up to dream the dreams that God has for a future generation. There's Davids in this room. Yeah. That now it's your time to dream the dreams of God and set those in motion based upon the promises of God coming from former generations. That's why you're, you're an extension of, you're a sila of the song that's coming uh, to your to your generation, you know, I, I love I love history, so I love uh, I love to tell old revival history stories, and and, uh, and you know I, t I tell people most of most of my best friends have been dead for over a hundred years <laughs> because I just love what they carried, and what they said, and how they lived their lives, and you watch how God interacted with them, and they would have an encounter, now they carry an encounter. And most of them, just like David, rose up out of some obscure place like, like Bedford, England, or, mm -hmm. or, or Walker, Wales, or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, uh, Cambus Lane, Scotland, or, or wherever, or, or the Red, Red River Meeting House in western Kentucky in a place called Rogues Harbor. Mm -hmm. Nothing but hillbillies, hellions, and whiskey running out <laughs> That's all <laughs> That's the only people that live there until God showed up. Because an old fellow named James McGreevy wrote in and they'd gotten rid of, they couldn't keep any preachers there. Couldn't even build a church hardly there because these outlaws and hellions had run them off. Beat them up, shoot them, whatever is necessary to get rid of the preachers. Until an old fellow named James McGreevy rode in on a wore out horse out of the Carolinas one time. And he got off the horse and he beat the dust out of his hat and he said, I'm not leaving. And he had one of those big old everybody pray kind of voices. He said when he would pray across down toward Red River, you could hear that his voice from miles just rolling across what was called the Barrens of Kentucky when he when he would pray. And uh, but he didn't leave when the when the Hellions showed up. Uh, he was there to stay because he he was he was there carrying prayer and promises. And at that time, he may not even had a grid for the understanding that you, that you would of what prophecy would look like. That was a that, you know anyway. So he would stand there and, and, and uh, 
And what he'd do, he'd just preach a while and then he'd fight a while. Preach a while and he'd fight a while. And uh, I've, I've always thought maybe that's where the Baptist denomination began. <laughs> preach a while and you fight a while. <laughs> now that was funny. You missed, a wonderful <laughs> you missed a wonderful opportunity for a chuckle. Please take advantage of those. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there would be, it would just be like not only warfare and the prayer and then the spirit trying to take land and take ground and take the atmosphere. There was a price to be paid that was, was introducing new possibilities to a whole region of Kentucky that had never experienced God because it was the frontier at that time. Well, imagine what David would have felt like and many others when they have to step into established arenas of thought and established arenas is that's the way it's always been. But then here comes guy, some guy with, with really, with really no, no credibility whatsoever except that there was a passion in his heart and therefore a call in his life to release the presence of God to his people. And, and I want to say this, God is going to, re, we're in a generation where God's going to reveal himself in ways that no other generation has ever experienced God. Amen. And some of us in this very room are carrying a responsibility, an ability to respond like David did, that are going to awaken nations and peoples, and people groups and, and uh, cities and churches, because you're good, out of a revelation of God, that, uh, that's, that's that's what you, what you carry, is a revealed truth. And there was, a, there was an old guy, in, uh, an old preacher in Ohio, back in the late 1800s, he used to stand up and, and, and pray in a traditional prayer, and he would preach every Sunday right outside of Dayton, Ohio, is where he pastored. His name was, his name was Milton Wright. And old Milton Wright would stand up and shake his fist in the pulpit, you know how they used to do, and he'd say, well, if God had wanted man to fly, he'd have given them wings. If God had wanted man to fly, he'd have given them wings. Well, Milton Wright had two sons, Wilbur and Orville. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys are sitting on the back row hearing their daddy say, if God had wanted man to fly, he'd have given them wings. In other words, one generation creating the limitations and the boundaries and the restrictions and the rules and the regulations and everything by which we will live our lives. And while one generation is throwing the limitations out there, there's next generation sitting on the back row and says, did he say fly? <laughs> Can you imagine what they felt when they looked at each other? <laughs> did Daddy say fly? He said he said, fly. Yeah, he said fly. <laughs> And what happened was, is they began to dream. Yeah. They, began, they, they didn't hear the limitations anymore because the dream had come alive. <laughs> and and to, hit, to the old guy's credit, I've got to tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is, is when that dream came fully alive in them, and they began to, to live their lives beyond the limitations of the former generation and the restrictions and so on. When they, once that broke in their own heart and they began to live the dream, the old guy is the one who turned then and raised all the finances and all the funds for all of the research and supported his sons mm -hmm. and lived the dream with him Come on. and brought mm -hmm. what he could bring to the next yeah. generation. Mm -hmm. And see, sometimes it's just a matter of giving, uh, giving a nod of permission that says, you know what, you guys, we're not, we're not just giving you permission to fly, we're telling you, you were born to fly. Yeah. And when you look at what David set in place in his day, David uh, radically stepped way away from what the former generation even understood or knew about God. In Saul's generation, there was no worship. But now in David's generation, he steps up, and one of the first things he does is he, he, says, he says, David and the captains, uh, let's call it pastor and elders for a minute, the governmental structural governmental leadership steps up. David and the captains separated to the service of the house of the Lord, Asaph, Shaduth, and then Heman, the three chief musicians, that they and under the hands of their fathers, their children and their children's children, would prophesy, and it says, upon the harp, upon the timbrel, upon the cymbals, upon the... And it starts identifying the very instruments that carry extended expression of personality and life and spirit and and again 
interaction and creativity with the God. That will determine what future generations experience in God. And it's for the musicians and the poets, and storytellers, let's say it, screenwriters, novelists, uh, and, and the list goes on, and artists. You know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but politicians don't shape culture. Lawgivers don't shape culture. People who carry the limitations and the boundaries, they don't shape culture. What they typically do is lawgivers and lawmakers will react to something negative in culture, be it racism, be it um, any of the other myriad of issues that, are, uh, that we're dealing with today through all the social media outrage and all. See, the whole world is living their lives right now with, with, this, with this sense of, of um, selective outrage and it's giving voice to everybody. And the thing is, we've all, we have all been giving a, given a, a, a platform for, to have a voice because of the technologies. We all, never has there been a generation that's talking more and few people, p fewer people listening. Nobody's listening because it's selective, selective outrage that's happening. Mm -hmm. But who, who shapes culture? Not those who rant and rave, but those who carry something yeah. of the Spirit of God born out of the overflow of their worship, causing people to, Im to be impacted by the presence of God. That's a promise that happened in David's day is also a promise for future generations because of this reality. And, and that last day, yeah, there's coming a time, there's coming a day, I will build again the tabernacle of David. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say lawgivers don't shape culture, uh, and I say songwriters do, how do songwriters shape culture rather than lawgivers? Songwriters can shape culture because they have access to the heart of the culture. Yeah. Wow. And if you can access people's heart, you can access their, their dreams. Mm -hmm. You can awaken their imaginations in a sanctified, healthy, and holy way. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Songwriters shape culture. Yeah. Artists shape culture. I'll get, I, I can give you an example. I love this illustration. I love this example because it's, it's true. Um, if I were at home, if my, grand, if my mother, who, who is still alive, she's 84 years old, and, uh, and she, said, she says, I can't die. Who would take care of all the old people around here? <laughs> she's, she's 84 and she runs her neighborhood. You know, she's one of those kind of, one of, those kind of ladies. <laughs> and she, she says, uh, uh, well, but if, I, if I were at my, my, she says, I'm determined to outlive everybody I don't like. <laughs> and so she's got that kind of grit and that's, that's how she lives her life. I remember, uh, and if I were at my, at my mother's house for Sunday dinner, you sit down to have, have dinner, and I can see her now. She'll say, hey, 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 get your elbows off of the table. And you know what I do? I, oh, I forgot. And I don't, how many of you were raised in a home where your elbows on the table is not a good idea? Okay. You, got a few, you know what I'm talking about. And so she says, get your elbows off the table. Who, who do you think you are? And I take my elbows off. And she says, I don't care if you are 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> or so. I'm not good with numbers. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> See, there's three kinds of fellers from Kentucky. The ones that can count and the ones that can't. <laughs> but if my mother was sitting, she would say, get your elbows off the table. My elbows come off the table. But sooner or later in your life, you come to the place that you want to ask the question. What is the big deal and why is it such a sin to put your elbows on the table? Come on. And, and the fact is, when Da Vinci painted the Last Supper, the only person in the picture with their elbows on the table is Judas. So what happened was an artist illustrates, interprets what he thinks from his imagination it must have looked, back, looked like back over a thousand years ago. It's culturally incorrect. It, it's not biblically sound at all. The whole picture, everything about it is is actually out of context. Mm -hmm. But because an artist depicts Judas as the one with his elbow on the table, now it becomes a, eventually becomes 
a belief system and a tradition and ultimately an etiquette mm -hmm. that causes it to be a negative, that you're identifying with Judas when you put your help on the table <laughs> in my mother's house. <laughs> <laughs> An artist just shaped culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. You remember uh, in 1829, some of you weren't around yet. <laughs> <laughs> but remember in 1829, there was a fellow put a poem in a newspaper in upstate New York. You remember, remember that poem? It was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature is stirred, not even a mouse. By the time this poem is over, we have a completely new understanding of what Christmas is about. It's not, and now it's not just about Emmanuel, God with us, Savior coming to the world, a Redeemer that will redeem all of humanity into a right relationship with the Father. It's about something else now, too. It's about a fat guy flying <laughs> through the air in a sleigh, coming down the chimney, carrying a pack on his back. He's got a reindeer with a big red nose that blinks. He's flying, to, and, then, and this guy knows everything, and he, he's everywhere. He, he knows all year if you've been good or bad, and he's going to, going to gift you according to the judgment. I mean, and I'm not an anti-Santa Claus guy, y'all. I, 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 he gave me a guitar one time. <laughs> what can I say? I, I appreciate his kindness. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we have a whole new book, set of belief systems that has dictated how we live our lives and how seasons come and go, and it's entire huge economy boosts are built around the fat guy showing up once a year for Christmas. I think that's why another reason that Christmas is all about getting fat. I, I just took some time off for Christmas to rest and just got fat and lazy. <laughs> but maybe that's a part of it as well. I, I really didn't realize it until I went to buy some shirts and I had to get my shirts in the men's maternity section. <laughs> and then I realized that I had ex fully experienced Christmas. <laughs> but, but, the, but, the, but the point is, you see, in former generations where these dreamers would come alive and, and uh, you know, uh, for example, I had another example is, you know, there would be no understanding or knowledge of William Wallace, for example, had there not been a poet named uh, Blind Harry wrote a 1200 line poem a hundred years after William Wallace lived telling of, of the legend and not just and many of the facts and, you know, in any culture, we all have those stories of the pastor that are filled with facts and fallacies and folklore and fable and, and so on. But there's also a, a truth that becomes known to the gen next generation about who they are as they identify with those promises that God set in motion to be on those lands. And sometimes the poets are the only ones that awaken us and remind us. That's what David did. They had completely lost a grasp of who they were. They didn't. And, and look what happened musically in, in, uh, in Moses' day. The people of God had no clue who they were. Even after the promises and covenants had been made with Abraham, and by, by, you, by the time you find Moses, Moses', uh, Moses generation was, uh, well, it was 400 years get this, 400 years of no song, 400 years of no dance, 400 years of no, no art, 400 years of no uh, cultural expression whatsoever. They were, they were devoured by Egypt and all of their identity had gone and even the promises of God and the covenants that it made was completely lost to them. And then, then of course we know what happens next. We know that after after 400 years, you, you, you don't know who you are. You have become that for generation after generation after generation. And then God says, Moses, uh, go ask Pharaoh to let my people go. No, he didn't. He took Moses through a transformation process that caused Moses to carry the heart and the desire of God to the degree that he could say, Moses, go tell Pharaoh. Let. Let my people go was not an appeal. Let my people go. Let is the same word God used when he said, let there be light. He wasn't asking permission. 
What Moses was to do is to go and to prophesy a let into a reality yeah. and set that promise in motion. Yeah. But that's not the end of the verse, is it? Let my people go that they may come away and worship. Mm -hmm. So again, it was about the restoration of worship. Yeah. In the same way that uh, when David would carry this grace that would release the presence of God, let there be glory and honor and praises. Let there is a, is a, is a declaration, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now we know what happens next. Moses uh, steps up and, uh, and to make a very long story short, they, they come out of Egypt according you know, to the, the purposes of God at the time. And, when they, and they get all the way down to the Red Sea. And uh, now they got a problem. Because when they get to the Red Sea, they're standing there looking at what 600 of the finest horses and chariots coming down on them. Here's standing the Red Sea. They're, Red Sea in front of them. They're in trouble. And all God knows is, I mean, all Moses knows, God said, go, set, you know, let my people go that they may come away and worship. And now he's standing there and all of God's people sees their dilemma and turns against Moses even. And what does Moses do? Well, what any, what any one of us would do. He raises up a stick. Oh, really? See, God, when you get to in a situation like that and you're a worship leader, and that's what he was, remember? He was leading them into a new day of worship. He's leading them into a whole new revealing of who God is in their midst. Because the promise all the way back was, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will be in your midst. Yeah. But all they had known is loss of song and creativity in life, because here was their sound. They were, for 400 years, mashing out bricks, mud between their toes, making bricks for the man. And their only song was, it was this moaning sound. And if any one of them even spoke up to interact one with another, they had this thing with little symbols on it that would rattle in it, and it would vex them unto attention and, and shut their voice down. What would it be like to be a people for 400 years you couldn't speak above a whisper? You couldn't in interact one with another without ever being reminded. We now when they get down to the Red Sea, and now it's all over. They thought they were free. When they get down to the Red Sea, they realize we're in trouble. Now, Moses raises the staff. When he raises up the stick, all of a sudden the Red Sea parts. And that tells us that you don't have to have sea parting faith. You just have to have stick raising obedience. <laughs> he could not make the sea part. But he was obedient just to do what God said, and that was raise the stick. So when you step out as a dreamer, sometimes you're going to find your place, find yourself in one of those places of, of impasse. And it's up to you to just simply do the next thing that God alerts and quickens you to do. Now, what does that say? Look how creative God is, is what that says. And the Creator created you to be creative. We're created by the Creator to be creative. We're also created to worship. So should not our worship be far more creative than just music? Or just, 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 just anything. You don't put it in one box. In that moment, see, worship and obedience are so interrelated that all he had to do was raise a stick and that was an expression of worship. And then God inhabited that moment and look what he did. Open the Red Sea. And now, here's the thing. Everybody knew if you step, then spend 400 years, water and dirt makes mud. But now, water and dirt doesn't make mud. Because God is not limited by mine or yours or anybody else's understanding. He can do what He wants to because He's, he's so creative that He can... I wish we had a couple hours to just talk about the universe. But the fact is, there's nothing in this universe that, that God cannot shift man's whole reality with. Uh, 
uh, anyway, if I get off on a horse for that, that rabbit trail, we won't get back. <laughs> but anyway, they start walking across on dry land, and for the first time, it, well, I've never seen the bottom of an octopus. <laughs> I've never seen a, a, a dolphin. I've never seen everything there was a whole new revelation of creation. And all of God's wonder began to come alive in those who only had a whisper for 400 years. And they get across on the other side and they watch God do the unthinkable. And then Miriam grabbed the tambourine and said, come on girls. Yeah. I would, and, and, and which is a scary thing you think about it. the very first worship leader in Israel was a woman with a tambourine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she grabbed, and, 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 it's, and it's the word tof, or tabret, where we get the word, it's the Hebrew word tof, tabret, timbrels and tambourine. Did you know what it was? She grabbed the instrument, and, and somebody needs to ask the question, where did she get a tambourine? That's right. That's right. <laughs> it was brought out as a spoil of Egypt, and it was the very instrument that was used to sh shut them down for 400 years is the beginning of their Come on. Yeah. So the very thing that the enemy wants to tell you, you cannot use that sound because that is not sanctified or godly. <laughs> there is no sound, no texture, no tone, no musical style. Is God is not afraid of, vo of volume. He's not afraid of rhythm. Mm -hmm. but, you know, th there's a lot of betaphobics in the church that thinks God's never heard rhythm. Mm -hmm. Let your heart get out of rhythm and you'll understand God created rhythm, the enemy did. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, all music is born out of that, that reality. Mm -hmm. Because we are created uh, for music. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're musical beings. You know, when God created everything with the sound of his voice, when he said, let there be. But he didn't do man that way, did he? Mm -hmm. Even the subatomic particles of the earth were laying there hovering and, and vibrating in anticipation in Genesis 1. And then when God speaks, it, he alerts even the subatomic particles of the ground to come alive to what they were created to sing and what frequency they were created to vibrate at. And then he reached down into that dirt. He didn't speak man out of that. Remember how he did it? It's the Hebrew word yatsar. Yatsar means he reached into that dirt that was without form and void. Y'all remember what the word is form and void? It's yabohu and, and tohu, which means nothing, ain't not, void. Shapeless, formless. Yabohu, tohu. It's like... Uh, tofu, same thing. <laughs> That's a big bunch of nothing, that tofu. <laughs> I'm a biscuit and gravy man. And uh, God bless you guys. Thank you for the thank you for the ride. There thank the, you, Rich. The best chauffeurs in England. God bless you guys. God bless you. Y'all know David Hatton? That's David Hatton, an incredible worship leader, songwriter, father in the in the faith of <laughs> Come on. An awesome guy. And uh, what were y'all talking about? Okay, and then so God looked down into that formless, and then He squeezed and yachts hard and pinched and formed. And then when you look at the, put it in the context of the Hebrew uh, writing, He He looked at that form that He had shaped, and He said, "Huh," and it, it's the word nafesh uh, uh, or nafak as to expel a shout. So if you shout, it's all the breath, the ruah. Breath, spirit of God. And the form said, So this awakened the response. And the second Hebrew word there for a living life is, is the word that means to pant as a woman in labor. So that means that the beginning of rhythm in humanity was born as creation responded to the Spirit of God, to the life of God. And so Adam was raised up as a worshiper. Just like all of creation and all of nature, created to reveal His glory by, by doing and being what it was created to do. And, that, and that's, but okay, let, let's get back to Moses. He comes over, uh, when, that, when that song 
is redeemed. Now, oh, let me remind you of this. Every great move of God and every revelation of God to another generation since that moment, you'll find that there was a, a sound that was connected to everything that God did from that day forward in regards to covenant to his people. See, covenant uh, involves music. It always involves land. It always involves, or, or sound, sound or music. Sound, land, and blood. This covenant is always uh, always connected to those, to those very things. And, and you see that music is, uh, you ever, we all, we've all heard music is universal, universal language. Music, universal, una is one, like unicycle. Verse is song. So when God spoke in the beginning, and remember, he was not limited like we are in the hearing of music. He spoke all the frequencies in the sound spectrum and beyond were released when he said light, he released the full intent of his nature into creation. Let there be. There's a, remember, declaration. And uh, universal. Music is universal. Song is geographical. You'll find that, uh, that song is always geographical. But, and, and by the way, what is song? Well, we know what song is. It's, it's a two-and-a-half-minute expression of rhythm and melody and imagery, and, and it has particular components and elements that make up song. No, that's not what song is. That's what the world has tried to define as song. That's not what song is. Lord, you are the strength of my life. You are my two-and-a-half-minute expression. Of <laughs> Look at the limitations. Because we've allowed the world to try to define for us what music is. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, there's dreamers and those who have encounters with God in this room get a hold of this reality. If we can change the way the church understands worship and music, we'll change the way the world encounters God. Because God wants to redefine music, but we don't need a new definition of God. We need a demonstration of, the, of God. The demonstration of the power and the wonder and the beauty and the awe and the, everything that God is lived out through what we consider to be music. But music is universal. Song is geographical. Melody is topographical. Did you, you, did you know that? Melody is topographical. Because melody is born out of responses of the human nature uh, engaging musically born out of our accents. And our accents are topographical as well. And that's where we find our melodies and the rise and fall of passion and emotion comes out of our accents. Um, uh, for example, if, if you're from a very cold, flat place, you will typically <laughs> speak with a very cold, flat accent. Come on. I'm from Wisconsin, you know what I'm saying. So, come on, yeah, my ain't not rich in the country because mono, monotone, monotonous, monotonous, if you listen to it very long. Because it's, and, and, and you'll find it, uh, again, in the topography. If you go to Hawaii, it's very coastal because, land, see, remember, landscape determines soundscape. And nature and creation will awaken the depth of the song of who you really are. And many times you don't even know until you maybe one day do a DNA test and find out you're from a place that carries the sound that awakens your full expression of who you are. When you sing, when you, when you play, even. you will hear the, ge the geographical nuances of the land that is in your blood. Covenant, sound, blood, land again. See that? And for, so if you're from a cold, flat place, what if you're like from Hawaii where the wind blows through the... Through, now, they didn't have any melodic structures as we understand today as far as instrumentally until the 1840s, 1860s. They got this instrument called the ukulele from Portugal and they were and also the guitar from Spain and began to redefine their, the melodies that they would sing. But as an indigenous na native people, they would sing... Uh, they had a conch shell for tone, and they had the, uh, drums and rocks and stones and such for the, for the rhythm to call their hearts to attention. 
Low frequencies always cause a response in the circulatory system. High frequencies always the nervous system. But when you find the full release of the frequencies that cause your spirit to respond and come alive, it will always be connected to lands and geography. Uh, an example, if, if, you're from a, if you're from a place like I'm from, and I care, I have English, Scots, Irish, and Welsh blood in my veins, and also on our side, Powhatan, Osage, and, and uh, Cherokee. So I'm like typical Americans, I've got all of those intermarried with covenant promises and blood running through my veins. And I come from storytellers, guardians of memories who carry the song and sound and pass to the next generation. And then the old Celtic knowings, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the old Celtic knowings, they would not want their children to ever learn how to read because if you learn how to read, you'll lose your memory. So you have to carry the knowings that are placed in your life by the sound of the former generation and their diction and articulation and inflection and the melody that is their accent, which is really a kind of an amazing, beautiful thing when you think about it. And uh, they discovered, and, and they discovered that all indigenous or Aboriginal peoples in the in the world all pass their knowings and beliefs to the next generation in the key of G. <coughs> what? In the key of G. What? Isn't that kind of odd? That when I see, and how does that work? When I become very passionate about what I'm saying, you'll find my voice as you would find your voice going to a particular pitch and resonance that denotes emotion and, and worth, value of life. When I want my kids to know something, I'll, I'll speak into them in such a way that they're hearing it tonally in ways. And they've discovered that those tones that come out of particular peoples carry the knowings. Now let's say, say I'm a, I'm a G note and Tom is a B note. What's your name? Krista. Krista? Yeah. Wow, that's a cool name. So I'm a G note. <laughs> Your Tom is a B note, Christoph is a D note. So now we know we have harmony and agreement. And strangely enough, through many studies, they discovered that, well, like when I meet Christoph, you know, for some reason, I just kind of, I know we could be friends. Because there's a, there's a kinship that just happens in the interaction. I get a good vibe off of Christoph, is what they would say. <laughs> you, know, you ever meet some people you think, no. <laughs> uh, we, we will, uh, you know, I'm glad you're here. We'll never be friends. <laughs> because you might just get a bad vibe off. Yeah. You ever notice sometimes when you just meet somebody and shake hands with them and you just automatically just kind of, hey, let's talk a minute. You know, because there's a, that's something you want to know them. You know, they're, they're just, I, I don't even know all the reasons why other than you just get a good, you know, vibe off of. Your spirit is kind of alerted to who they are and who they are. Well, that's, and that's a part of that G, B, D, harmonic, uh, symphonic agreement that is formed within the heart of man. And uh, we can also call it Holy Spirit discernment sometimes. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could really function with Holy Spirit discernment rather than suspicion born out of old disappointments? Mm -hmm. And you could really be, you know. But... When you, uh, but we're talking about the accent. Do you know that there are some voices in the past that carried such a presence of the Holy Spirit tonally that people could sit hour after hour after hour, uh, almost like under the spell of the truth and the beauty that would be declared by someone like Charles Spurgeon into a room. And for... And, and there's many others, but Charles Spurgeon, of course, being the, the prince of preachers, is one of those that knew how. He had those musical sensitivities and poetic sensitivities to awaken and beautify truth rather than old heart, you know, if God had wanted man to fly. No. He would speak the word of God in such a way that he would beautify truth and he would embrace truth. He went, half of England came to Jesus because of this guy right down the road here was carrying poetry in his bones. You ever, are you all familiar with Charles Spurgeon? Heard much about him? We, we try to beat their football teams. There's actually a college, so we don't like Spurgeon very oh. much. <laughs> <laughs> we usually crush them in football. Yeah. yeah. But he, he wasn't, 
He wasn't real big on football. <laughs> <laughs> but he was just amazing. Call him the Prince of Preachers. And, but he carried, he carried the sound of the song of the land, the voice of the land, and, and, uh, which is a powerful, powerful musical tool that uh, awakens agreement. And, uh, you, you know, when I say, uh, we'll, we'll come back to him in just a second, but when I, when I say uh, melody uh, is topographical, See, I'm from a place like in Kentucky with this Scots, Irish, Welsh blood and all that, and English blood. I have the, the blood in me that, that causes me, in, you know, when we came over onto our side and into the isolation of those mountains, uh, we found the very song that our people sung here uh, within us. Does that make sense? In other words, we so identified with the land that we felt this is home, this is belonging. And our song continued to reflect and resonate the what was in our DNA in the homeland because this belonging part of the language of music is belonging and also part of this longing our longing for the hills of Scotland and Ireland would always be heard when we when we would begin to sing because those again topography determines the melody and that's how we knew we were in a place of our song now I'll give you an example uh, we, and the, the sound of the mountains would be, Oh, I've just seen a rock of ages, Jacob's ladder hanging down. See all that rise and fall, bending notes, hills and valleys, and across the barrens you could hear, even when our old Pentecostal people in our part of the country, even when they pray, Oh, <laughs> they get into that, that old chant kind of a thing. They're like, Oh, well, mm -hmm. And, it, and it's a part of the song of the land that awakens the accent that causes that. Did I ever tell you about, about a fellow named uh, Claude Ely? Claude Ely was a, was, a, was a young boy living in the mountains, a big stone gap in Virginia. His daddy was a coal miner. And then right in around the big stone gap in that land and in those mountains there, everybody there was Scots, Irish, and Welsh coal miners and, yeah, that landed on that side coming out of broken covenants and finding belonging. And they carried that, those, that old song, what, the, the, what we call lilting. But the men never sung in the house. Only the women would sing in the house. The men, but the women would never dance in the house. They would dance in the community things. But, and the men never sung in the house because that's a womanish kind of thing, is the way they would say it. And a womanish thing is, oh, why? Because the women would sing all day in the house because they had the children. And, you, and they would lay the children in the baby bed. Now they got to go do dishes or iron or whatever they're doing. But they wanted the child, the, the, the babies, to always hear the voice. And, all, and a lot of times they didn't even know the lyrics of the old songs. So what they would just do is what's called lilting. As long as the baby could hear the mother's song and voice, it caused them to not only know where she was, but it caused them to know who they are. Does that make sense? And they grow up and they carry another generation of the song of the land of Ireland or Scotland or England, wherever they were from. But old Claude's laying there 12 years old, they would discover the doctor says he's going to die. And, and so at 12 years old, uh, basically it says there's nothing we can do. But poor people, coal miners, he has to go to work anyway. And the mother had to go to work ironing and cleaning the house anyway. They would have to leave their 12 year old son at home. And eventually they knew they'd have to stop leaving him home because they'd get to where he, when it comes time for him to die, they would try as best they could to be there. But it was a, can you imagine the horrors of that in those days in a little cabin somewhere? You, can't, you come home and you don't know if your little boy's gonna be alive or not. And, and they, they walked up on the porch and they heard inside the house, ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. And when I hear that trumpet sound, I'll get up out of the ground. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. He was just singing it like a mountain chant over and over and over. And guess what, y'all? I'll make this long story short. Claude Ely didn't die. He found his song. 
And, if, and somehow or another, a truth was awakened in his spirit, his body, his mind. He began to agree with who God says he was supposed to be. And that song awakened healing in him. It was supernatural. you got to say it's supernatural. Yeah. Ain't no grave going to hold. And yet he went on to become one of the most famous Pentecostal preachers in all of those mountains. And he would grab up an old D28 guitar, an old Martin, and rake on that thing and sing, Ain't no great. And they said all the old women would. As long as he would hold a note, they would shout and bang on the tambourine. <laughs> this, this, that mountain Pentecostal kind of thing. He was, he was one of the that carried that. And until eventually became so famous that he made it all the way to Tupelo. <laughs> Tupelo, Mississippi. <laughs> and when he gets to Tupelo and he's there in a tent meeting, this, this Jewish lady who was married to a Welshman, they decided to bring their little boy to hear him, hear Claude Ely sing and tell the story about what God had done. And of course, the little boy's name was Elvis. And so when they brought Elvis in the, and heard the song of one that had been raised up off of a deathbed as a child because he found his song, it so impacted Elvis's life that he began to live out some of those old Pentecostal rhythms and musical expressions and his body agreed with it, even though the theology may not of the day, because you know, as you know, Elvis was uh, not exactly accepted because we all know, like, like in those cultures, you know, um, like for, for example, they don't allow drinking because it leads to dancing. <laughs> or that they've got all of these, now that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you see what I mean? They've got all of these expectations and things that they, that they put, but, but that's where Elvis found his song. And, uh, but you hear that, uh, my point is, is you can hear the sound in the song of the land mm -hmm. because landscape also awakens the soundscape. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important for us to know this if we're carrying kingdom, uh, I mean, what nation starts to rise up in your heart and what what are the little tones and nuances that that awaken you those are important many times to your call now let me show you one other a picture of how powerful melody can become uh it was, it was okay if i i know i don't sing like you would you know maybe not the musical style that you grew up with but here I want, can i do just a little more singing i'll show you the picture of how melody works melody works like this how much is that doggy in the window? The one with the waggity tail. How much is that's a pitiful dog. You surely got more dog in you. Let's start again. How much is that doggy in the window? The one with the waggity tail. How much is that doggy in the window? I do hope that doggy's for sale. Now you know what that means? That song means that song means somebody gonna get a puppy. <laughs> now listen to this. How much is that dog in the window? You know what that song means? That dog is gonna die. <laughs> to death in that He don't have water. He don't have food. He's just going, he's just rotting away to nothing. His little ribs are sticking out. He'll never chase a rabbit. He'll never have anybody that'll love him enough to scratch so his foot can do that. It never happened in his life. All I did was change the melody. One of them means, and one of them means dig a hole for this dog. It's over. But all it was was the difference in the melody. Now, where you live and how you live should also be about why you live. Hmm. Okay. Musically speaking. How do you respond creative, creatively? How do you as a creative, as a worship leader, as, as, as one who's call, called to paint the pictures of the beauty of God to your generation? How do you respond creatively to your landscape? How does the landscape awaken truth in you? See, David was onto something when he would just 
seven times a day go for a walk and look out across a hill or look out at a, at a mountain or, or walk through a valley in the song awakening him. And when he would write that song, he'd get it over to these folks and say, here, where are, he had scribes that followed him 24-7. And they were, uh, and all of a sudden when he would break into song, they would write down every word. And I, and I, I specifically do that because all, all of them were left-handed. Uh, all scribes were left-handed. If, if your child was born, he was left-handed, you know, he will be a scribe in the house of the Lord. And he would. Because, you know, all language, all written languages converge in Zion. If you live in any culture east of Zion, you write right to left. If you live west, you write left to right. Right there in Zion. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But, uh, uh, I don't know what I was telling you. Topographical land. Yeah, yeah you're, 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 the sound in the, in the song of the land is what, how you respond create, creatively to your landscape. Oh, that, that, that's, that's the, what I'm saying. It's, he would just walk out in the, in the cool of the evening, if you will, and he would see a beautiful, and he would start writing that, and then the scribes, he would say, get this over to the chief musician upon so-and-so, because yeah. that's the only tone or texture that will rightly reveal in the prophetic and the spirit realm what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, and they would interpret it accordingly. And then it would become a sung truth unto all generations, and we're still singing them today. Mm-hmm. That's the power of truth. Now, we live in a day where we, remember when we started off, they were talking about this, this uh, uh, selective outrage. The only thing that is going to be able to invade the selective outrage of, of the cultures fighting around their personal preferences, first, we've got to become a people that cease to preach our personal preferences as if they're convictions of the Holy Spirit and put other people under bondage to our ideas. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> we, we preach our personal preferences as if they're convictions of the Holy Spirit and put other people under bondage to our ideas. Mm-hmm. But we don't change their life. We can only make them mad or angry or some passionate emotion and stir up more conflict. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to have to unveil the beauty and the grace and the mercy and the wonder and the awe of God in this generation. Or it's just going to keep on finding you know, gender issues, race issues, political issues, politicians, po- poli- politics. Poly means many, and ticks is blood suckers. <laughs> we've got just many blood suckers looking for positioning. But we've also got some folks God's raising up in those arenas to call them to be kings that are carrying the heart of God. Mm-hmm. And those are the ones that will carry song. And the overflow of their worship will make a difference. But now, I was, I, went, I was talking about song. Uh, I've been speaking a lot. And I, and I, and I say, what, where, where, oh, preach, preaching personal preferences. Oh, to beautify the truth, that's our job. Yeah. Carry the sound in the song so much that it, that it reveals his nature, mm-hmm. his glory, mm-hmm. and so on. Here's how, here's how important it is we do that at this time. Because the world and their arguments have become so fact-oriented. And they're challenging everyone on their facts, right? When in fact, they did the same thing with Jesus. Remember all the brainiacs and the academics that would always try to challenge Jesus on his history and his theology? You remember what Jesus would do? It's, well, our fathers and other, they would start this stuff and they'd ask him some question and then wait for the answer and he'd say, well, consider the lilies. <laughs> and away you would go. See, he's not, he's not going to be trapped in, in, on, on some battlefield of debate. He, debating is in Romans 1, and it's right in the same verse with the whoremongers, the thieves, and the murderers. We're not sent here to, to debate necessarily the Word of God. We're called here to reveal the beauty and the wonder and the power and the love of Jesus. That's why God's awakening the poets with the sensitivities and the sensibilities to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's what he did with, uh, that's what he did with uh, David. He re- revealed presence and truth. 
And that's why it became the truth. Out of his creative expression, his poetry and song. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at Jesus again. That challenge him on this mountain or that mountain. And he'd say, well, consider the heavens. And he'd leave. Or consider the raven. He would point out something. And can you imagine those brainiacs now, four days later? What in the world was he talking about? Consider the lily. Oh, see, you know, a lily. They'd start considering the lily. And then God would reveal something that they never could have gotten in some sort of intellectual wrestling match. But something that touched their heart. And now their minds had opportunity yeah. to, to uh, re respond to the wonder. And they would come from that place. And, and when you, it, sometimes he wouldn't even, he would just say something like, well, foxes have their holes and birds have their nests and son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I'll get back with you on that. And he'd wander off. Other times he would do this. He'd say, well, a certain man went to a certain village in a certain place. He'd just tell a story. And they weren't even facts. Had they been facts, he would have given the man's name and where it was and so on. But rather than that, he accessed imagination and the desire of God and would tell a story in such a way that you could see what he was saying. See what I'm saying? You notice we say, see what I'm saying? Shouldn't that be hear what I'm saying? But rather than and had the full experience, eye gate, ear gate, their entire spirit man being able to experience revealed truth. He's talking and the cancer's gone, or he's talking and the blind eyes healed, or, or he finds some way to reach into the desire of God and the intent of God through his imagination and he'd spit on the ground. But he often see creativity one definition of creativity is the ability to access God's options. And God is not confined uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, the limitations that we place on Him. Now, writers today, uh, 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 did you ever grow up here in this? Oh, hey, listen, man, that, that, that's just your imagination. As if it was a curse? That's just your imagination. So now we're living in a generation where we've learned to um, devalue imagination when it's one of the most valuable things that Jesus functioned in. Uh, and, and here's the difference. Now, oh, that's, that's just your imagination, so devalue that. While the world is writing from a whole other place, not even imagination anymore. They're writing from fantasy. And I'm here to tell you, imagination is real. Fantasy is not. Mm -hmm. See, fantasy carries an engagement of, 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 of a bit of, of, a, of a dark side of spirituality that, that awakens us to fantasy that is not real. Mm -hmm. But truth is real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, that's why Jesus would just tell a story. And out of that, it wasn't about facts, it was about truth. And he was the way, the truth. And the life. So he would speak out of the depth of who he was. Yeah. And his storytelling and his songwriting, if you will, or his poetry. A poet, a poet don't look out there and tell you that's a tree. A poet doesn't have to tell you that's a tree. You know it's a tree. A poet will tell you how to feel and experience the wonder or the beauty of the tree. Mm -hmm. And God, all through Scripture, would use poet or uh, use, use metaphor. David would use strong metaphor so that we could reveal the nature of God. And then he would create melody that would sustain its impact. And, uh, and the instrumentation sustain its impact. You know, an old tree only has four strong desires. One is to stand, one is to live in the light, one is to reach toward heaven, and one is to dance with the wind. From the day that there was a little seed, felt the wind, and rolled off, into, off of the leaf into a dark that he did not know, reaching for a light he could not see, and then one day breakthrough happened. And when he broke, broke through now, for the first time he could stand, live in the light, reach toward heaven, and dance with the wind. Why is it important for a tree to dance with the wind? 
Because if the wind don't blow, a tree don't grow. Because that dance alone causes his roots to continue to break down into the life-giving water that enables him to stand, yeah. live in the light, be sword him, and dance with the wind. But if our religion and our opinions and our ideas are so rigid that we cannot dance with the wind, we will miss all that God has for us and has for our lives to grow, to rise up in him and produce the fruit that we were born to produce. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just simply begins with those who are brave enough to dream. You know, dreaming is very dangerous. So let's do it. <laughs> you know, dreaming can be, it can be, it can be really dangerous. Yeah. Did he say fly? <laughs> See, there's an old guy telling you today, you can fly, you will fly, you were born to fly. Yeah. When David set those mentors and fathers in place, do you know, notice what he did? He set those fathers in place and established an apprenticeship type system within the, the musical ranks of 38,000 and 4,000 musicians and every hour on the hour for 24 7 for 33 years same length of Jesus life a fresh expression of creativity would enter the room mm -hmm. and they would keep on because the, under the hands of their fathers those apprentice mentors had given them permission to fly and to write the songs that would only come from heaven mm -hmm. to hear the sound of God's desire and musicify it, musify it, how to uh, put tone and melody and life in it so it will, the next generation will know it and sing it, hear it, be it. Uh, really. And now here, here's, here's what that looks like. When he, when they would lay hands on the sons and daughters, it was a, it was a matter of now, uh, they had that mentorship program in place. But a mentor is not some old guy that tells you what to do and how to do it. That's not what mentoring is. You know what mentoring is? Mentoring is a generation that values and loves you enough, not, not just to tell you what and how to do, but just loves you enough so that you cannot keep from doing what you were born to do. Mm -hmm. And what you were born to do is come fully alive as those who beautify the truth to your generation. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, you know, I, I just I speak that as a blessing over you guys today. Yes. That somehow or another you're gonna you're, those things that that um, that the that the world tries to confine you to some religious ideology. No, you're gonna be you're gonna dance with the wind. You're gonna reach toward toward the heights of what God created you to do. Mm -hmm. And you're stable enough to stand, but you're flexible enough to to bend. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, now there are some foundational doctrinal truths and theologies that have to be a part of that, that root system going to life-giving water rather than confusion and so on. And that's one of the reasons you're here in a place like this. Yeah. Uh, there was an old preacher back in 1800 named Sam Jones who led a million souls to Jesus and then disappeared. They buried him in the hills of obscurity in Georgia. A million souls came into the kingdom because of him. And he, he used to say this, he says, I hate theology and botany, but I love Jesus and flowers. <laughs> because he had this sensitivity that there was something awake in him deeper than just intellectually wrapping concepts around the Word of God, which can be a beautiful thing. But there's something that has to happen in the heart that creates your destiny and future. And that's what happened with David. And he found his in song. <laughs> And ultimately wound up being one of the, one of the ultimate theologians uh, uh, in the history of humanity. Yeah. Because of the revelation that would happen when he would write those songs. <laughs> so, kind of an amazing thing when you think about it. Now, we've talked about so many things, and I don't have conclusions. Uh, when, when I get tired of thinking, I just wander off. <laughs> <laughs> But, but if there's any, if I left anything hanging anywhere and if there's any questions you'd like to, like to ask or anything, I'd be happy to try to give you a quick answer to those questions. And, and, uh, but thank you guys so much for letting me come. Yeah. I just want to remind you that we will never change culture by becoming like the culture. Mm -hmm. But we will never change the church by becoming like the church. Mm -hmm. So what it is that God has called you and raise you up for your generation. Sing it with everything you've got. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. And, 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 and let the revealed presence of God in your life be what de determines your song. Okay? Well, God bless y'all. Thank you for letting, for letting me come.